10. And I'm here, and she's in France, in Paris. So at least I can show her that I thought of her. And I have to bring a few gifts back, too, to, make, to prove it. So anyway, that being said, back to consciousness. So we've been hearing a lot about, uh, in terms of this question that Rajiv posed early on, is leadership about clout? about the span of your power, your influence. And of course, I think we've been hearing quite a bit about the fact that it's not quite that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something that comes from within. And I'm going in that direction myself, but in the domain that is also my domain of research, which is Psy Research. And we heard about psychokinesis versus healing as you, you, you created a contrast between them. The truth of the matter is even psychokinesis is not mind over matter. It's not will over this harsh world. It's not imposing your will. There's something very different going on. Uh, so we call it the influence of the mind on objects, but all we can say right now is that there seems to be a correlation between something that's going on inside me, which I may call intent, intention, and something happening outside, whether that outside is a living system or it's a biological system. And we can't quite say that I'm doing it to it, even in the case of random number generators. In other words, I think that this word of power or even energy might misdirect a little bit the what's going on in terms of psychokinesis, let alone the subject I'm going to be talking about, which is a bit different. So it's not quite the struggle, the, the, the kind of very male, young vision. It's me, my mind, getting to overcome the elements, the nat nature out there. And I think that in this whole concept of leadership that we're talking about these two days, which includes uh, this question of values and purpose and energy, we need to add a fourth element, which is connectedness. This is not happening. Uh, it's not just my will that's coming out and kind of pulling myself and the world uh, in a certain direction. It's more that I'm connecting to something deep. It's, there's a receptive aspect to it, not just a projective aspect. And that connection is maybe enabling myself to orient things in a certain direction. So this is going to be a little bit of theme that I'll be coming back to, that he, hidden behind this concept of energy, which sounds kind of like from me to it or from me to my future, there's another concept which is much more yin, much more receptive, and that what all we can say about it is it represents something like connectedness. So influence through connectedness. Now, I'm not going to talk about this either. Now, you may, some of you have, may have read a couple of weeks back that ça y est, finally we have made the breakthrough, telepathy from <laughs> they had the nerve to say the first successful telepathy experiment across 4,000 miles. And in fact, of course, this was not what we call telepathy. At best, I'll call it techno-telepathy. Techno-telepathy is when you hook up two brains and you use all kinds of paraphernalia, like EEGs and transcranial stimulation and so forth, and you manage to read out something from one brain translate it through wires and signals and send it across the internet to another brain that manages to decode what that first brain was thinking. So this was a breakthrough. It's a big technological breakthrough. But of course, it's not, the word telepathy is a bit, let's say, uh, a marketing uh, ploy. Uh, because when we talk about telepathy generally, and for the last 150 years, we're talking about something called mental telepathy like no wires. Uh, and this is the, the domain that interests me. 
uh, not because the other isn't interesting, but it just so happens this is what uh, I'm interested in. So what is telepathy? Basically, it's this idea that one person at a certain distance experiences something. Usually, it's something traumatic, something powerful, something intense. And somehow, some other person at a distance, without any other sensory information, is somehow experiencing partially that first person's, uh, what they saw, what they felt, what they heard, what they tasted. It doesn't work like a camera, but we have enough information to know that something went on, and sometimes it's pretty precise. So this is telepathy, and this is one thing I'll be talking about. And the, there, there are quite a few things that can be said about it, but before getting to that, just to introduce the, the general concept, there's one more, which is precognition, which I'd like to talk about. And that is that something happens Monday that I have a vision of something, let's say, uh, a, a volcano that's going to explode with great precision. And sometime later, maybe two days later or three days later, it happens with the exact same detail. And it's not just an inference. It's not because I've been studying uh, volcanic explosions in Southeast Asia or whatever. It's because I wake up out of a nightmare with this persistent image and dream that there's going to be an explosion in this very place. There's no data leading me to that. It's a total surprise. So when these kinds of experiences happen, we talk about precognition, something that we could not infer logically. So these are the two phenomena that I'd like to focus on, and mostly from a research perspective, from an experimental perspective, to just say, how in the world can we address these kinds of phenomena within a, a laboratory context. So the first way that these were being addressed was just by collecting cases. Lots and lots and lots and lots. Thousands and thousands of cases have been collected in England, initially, uh, in the United States, in France, in Germany, in most of Europe, actually. And there probably are case collections also in this part of the world, which I'm not aware of. That's one approach, and that's kind of interesting. Out of thousands and thousands, I can pick a few, of course. This one happened to be with the sinking of the Titanic, which some of you must know about, at least, because given the film that came out on this. Um, it happened in April 1912, and there are dozens of cases that we reported that somebody said to somebody else, I have a very bad feeling this ship is going to sink. And they said it, of course, before the ship, ship sank. And they said it to somebody so there's an independent witness, or they wrote, or something happened. So we know it wasn't, they're not making it up after the fact. So there are many, many cases like this. Here I'm just giving one because it so happened that in this case, the person wasn't expecting anything. This, this person, it's a woman in New York, who woke up her husband in the middle of the night saying something terrible has happened. My mother, I saw her on a lifeboat. I don't know why, but she, she was on a lifeboat, something that happened. And, and her husband said, you had a dream. Go back to sleep. And then, you know, two days passed. And of course, everybody started hearing about the Titanic. And there were lists coming out as to the survivors. And, she looked in the list of survivors and found her mother on the list in one of the lifeboats, of course. But the interesting thing here was that she had no idea her mother was on the Titanic. Her mother had decided to do a surprise visit to her daughter um, on the other side of the Atlantic. So this is interesting because there was no expectation, nothing. Another example, Mark Twain is a pretty well-known novelist. He's one of the the, the greatest novelist of the United States, uh, Huckleberry Finn, and you, know, you may have heard of him. And he had a nightmare. He, he had arranged for his brother, Henry, to have a job, a job on a steamboat called the Pennsylvania. And so his brother was working on the steamboat. But one night, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, woke up with a horrible nightmare. He saw the ca a casket 
suspended between two chairs, which is a very weird thing to do with a casket. Uh, and on it was Henry, in, you know, in it. And, of, so, and the weirdest thing was that there was like this bouquet of flowers, white flowers, with a rose on it, right in the middle. So a week later, eight days later, the Pennsylvania exploded. There was an accident. His brother was very seriously injured. Uh, uh, Mark Twain rushed to his deathbed. Uh, and at some point, I, from what I remember with the story that Mark Twain fell asleep or he went upstairs while, I think he died first, then they were going to bury them. There was a series of coffins in the room, and for some reason, Mark Twain, when he woke up and he came in the room, his brother was already in the coffin, suspended on two chairs, and he's looking at him, and, uh, and at that moment, a nurse, a voluntary nurse, volunteer, came down the stairs with a bouquet. Well, you got it, right? She came down the stairs and she placed it. So his dream came true. I'm sorry, I don't know why I should, there are some uh, stories that I really shouldn't bring out. I mean, he wasn't, any, he wasn't a relative of mine, Mark Twain. Okay, let me uh, get to a second approach. The first approach was this approach with intensive case studies. The second approach is to say, let's see if we can see it live in front of our eyes rather than just historically gathering all kinds of cases. And there were many, actually not that many, but there were some very good uh, individuals, let's say mediums, psychics, starting in the 19th century, going into the 20th century, and still today also there are some who seemed to able to reproduce uh, some impressive phenomena on command. So uh, again, here, this is not my intent to just wow you with big experiences, but just so to give you one or two examples uh, of how this works, I will in a moment. I'll give them right afterwards. But essentially, the idea is to have people that are really talented in this area and to study repeatedly the same person day in, day out, and to see how it works. This is the exceptional, another approach that I call sometimes the elitist approach. We're just going for the exceptional. Exceptional cases and exceptional individuals. But there's another approach, which, is, which was initiated by this man, J.B. Rhine, in the 1930s. And his idea was to get out of the whole exceptional side approach and to kind of find a democratic approach. Is there a chance that these phenomena are occurring at a very low level, perhaps, but continuously for anybody? Maybe under unusual circumstances, but they're not like Martians, that they're the gifted ones and we're the, the, the dull ones. It, that it's happening at some so small scale for all of us. And I think this is approach is particularly relevant to these two days here. So that's why I'm going to insist on this approach rather than the elitist approach, because it has something to say about what we can discover about ourselves. So Ryan's approach was basically to take a deck of cards, especially made cards called Zener cards, and to, there, though you see there are five different signs there, and you have them five times each, that means 25 cards, and basically you shuffle the cards, in one way or another, and you pull one after the other, and the other person there has to guess which card you're pulling. And then you accumulate the statistics. If you're just doing one success out of five, that's not very good, that's chance. If you're doing better, then you're, you're above chance. And that's what he's testing, see if normal people can have above chance scores. And um, so the way it would work was generally in the very early experiments, this is 1930s, so excuse the quality of the film, but basically the per, on the one side of a panel, there's a, a person that's trying to deal the cards into one of those five positions, and on the other side, there's 
there's the person who's pointing and saying, I want you to put it here, I want you to put it here, I want you to put it there. And then they just accumulate the number of cards and see how many did they get right. Very basic, I mean, it's very low-tech approach. Uh, but it had to start somewhere. So this is where it started. And there were many different variations on this. Initially, like I said, with these kinds of simple setups that basically anybody can do. And then they got progressively, they started to get electromechanical with electronic shuff electrical mechanical shuffling systems. And then they got to be electronic. And progressively, we moved to random number generators all the way up to the random number generators that are now that you can plug in with a USB card to your computer. And you can program games. This is one of the things that I had done is that I created a CD-ROM with games for testing ESP, not, not with cards, but different kinds of approaches. OK, so this was the original, demo, let's democratize Psy, the American dream. It's everybody can do it, right, uh, this kind of thing. So I'm not going to stick with this too long. It's just to say that how do you deal with data? Because the data that came through here, these are, as Dean said this morning, quite small effects. They're real, but they're small. If you get 51%, if it, let's say it's a coin flip, and you get 51% over 100 trials, eh. If you get 55%, eh. But if you get 51% over 10,000 trials, that's very significant, right? You see that it's, it's a whole different thing if you get 1% over 10,000 trials. So meta-analysis is just a way of saying, if we put together hundreds of studies that have been done, and there have been literally hundreds of these studies, can we say that there is a difference between what you expect by chance and what was actually obtained? That's basically what meta-analysis is. And I'm not going to stick with this too much, but you've seen lots of zeros and ones. But basically, just so you know, when you have 0 0.01, that's what we call statistically significant. When you have 0 0.00, the six sigma, what we call, then you call the news conference, and you, you announce big news, and that's what we call the hard sciences kind of, you know, that's when you start celebrating. And when you have that many sigmas, then we're just going to industrialize. We're going to the laboratory, and we start having control processes, and then you, you just quit your job and go do something else because there's nothing more to discover. Go somewhere else. Now it's just going to processes and industrialization. So this is the general kind of rule of thumb. And there, there's something we call effect sizes. From An effect size is saying if you have, for example, 1% better than chance, that's good. It's statistically significant. It could be very significant, but it is meaningful. Can you use it? And so effect sizes measure what you can use, whether it's a realistic, um, let's say, pragmatic result, as opposed to just being statistically impressive. Is this, under, is this opaque? I know it's boring, but is it opaque? OK. I'll, we'll see now. So, Aspirin, just to give you an example. Uh, aspirin was studied, uh, and there was a very, they were saying, how does aspirin affect heart disease? This is really normal, no healing, pharmaceutical industry classic. How much does it affect, does it help heart disease? So they did a very long-term study with physicians. There were 22,000 people who participated in this study. And lo and behold, in 1988, they discontinued the study. It was discontinued. It actually, they stopped it. Why? Because they thought it was unethical to continue doing this study. Because the people that didn't receive, that got the placebo, as opposed to the, the, the aspirin, they were saying it's unfair to them. We've been giving them a placebo for all these years, and they're losing their, you know, we should be giving them aspirins. We have enough proof now. They had a proof of P equals 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. So they stopped the study. But what was their effect size? It was minuscule. 
meaning the effect size was there, 0 0.034. That means that at best, you'll have, I think it was something like less than 1% of those who would have gotten cardiovascular disease if they didn't take aspirin, are you following this? Less than 1% will not get heart disease if they take aspirin. That's how small that effect was, meaning it just gives a tiny, tiny advantage to you if you take aspirin. Nevertheless, it's considered that aspirin is good for you, for heart disease. So that's, this is just to so understand the difference between effect size and what is statistically significant. So, and as far as <laughs> I'm concerned, that's basically, that's better advice than just <laughs> taking aspirin. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this, but it's, the, the main thing here is to say that when we did an analysis of all kinds of studies using, uh, you know, these cards, or random number generators, when we say, okay, the person is just doing this, just pointing, is it this, is it left or is it right? Is it the, the circle or is it the square or is it the plus? When we do these studies and we accumulate them and we see their success rate, they get a very, very small effect, 0.01, which is in the same ballpark as the aspirin study, but it's very significant, meaning normally at that point we should decide this has been demonstrated, even if it's not very useful. It's scientifically demonstrated, but can we use it? That's a different issue. Okay. But then we started to get a little bit more intelligent about these studies. We said, can we learn anything from them? And one of the things we did learn from it is that not everybody is born equal. There are some people that were having a bit bigger scores than others, and some that were literally missing all the time. They kept on getting the wrong card, the wrong coin flip, naming it the wrong way. And so the, the general description is from many, many experiments and tests where we give you know, psychometric tests, we, personality, MBTI, all these things, Myers-Briggs type, and some of you may know of it. The general outcome is that people who are relatively extroverted, good social adjustment, that's the real word, uh, who are not particularly neurotic or not particularly tense in relationships, do better than those who are on the other side. So these are a number of descriptors. These are on these tests where you check and you say, I'm like this, I'm like that, I'm like this, I'm like that. People that tend to be on the left-hand side were the same people that kept on getting better scores in these quick tests. You, you see, there is a correlation there. Okay. Another correlation, which is famously known as the sheep-goat effect. I, don't ask me why. This is, has to do with the Bible. I'm not sure it's interested with you, but basically, this lady here, who's a professor at the City University of New York, discovered a very interesting effect. If you just ask people, do you believe that these phenomena are real? Yes, no. Do you believe that it's possible to have good scores here and now, yourself, in this test we're going to do in three minutes? Yes, no, maybe, and so forth. So she accumulates all these scores, and she gets a profile. And at the two extremes of the profile are the people who say, absolutely they're real. I am totally convinced. And on the other edge, end of the scale, you have the people that are, are you kidding me? Do I look like I'm naive or something? Of course they don't exist. And of course I'm not going to get any special scores here. So now this is so far just purely psychological. People have their opinions and convictions and so forth. But what she found that if we call the blues the sheep, the ones that say yes it exists, and if we call the pinks the goats, what she found is that the sheep tended to have positive scores. But this is exactly the same objective test. You just have somebody turning cards and somebody down there trying to guess what that next card is. So the fact that you believe or you don't believe should be of absolutely no help, right? If 
this doesn't exist. But strangely, the sheep, the ones that were convinced, were getting better scores. And what's even worse, or more bizarre, is that the goats were not a chance. They were actually getting scores below chance. As if they were, because, how do you get scores below chance? It's almost like you have to know what the target is and then avoid it. So this is very interesting because uh, we're going to come back to this whole thing about belief and the impact of belief on the way that we act and what intuitive decisions we take or don't take. So this, this was interesting. This did come out of the, that era of working with these kind of mechanistic card turning approaches. Another, and this last, I'll just stop there, is the decline effect. Scientists sometimes can be pretty thick. They discovered that if you keep on, you know, turning cards and writing down a number on a piece of a paper, and you keep doing this for an hour, at first people's scores are good, and progressively they get worse and worse. Now, again, if these phenomena are real, that's totally understandable. I mean, it's basic psychology. You know, you get bored after a while, you get tired, you get tense, and it's not a very meaningful thing that you're doing, just turning over cards and writing a number on the, somebody that's in another room trying to catch that card. At first, it's exciting and different, and then it drops. But what's interesting is that the scores do reveal that. So there's something meaningful going on there. OK, so you may recognize, later we were talking about uh, movies quite a bit. This, you know where this is from? Minority Report. This was about, you know, how do you get these people that are dedicated, what we were talking about, dedicated people that just do, you know, become specialized. And this, you know, well, this science fiction film is about taking some people and sticking them in kind of a pool, and that's all they do in life. We're feeding them intravenously and so forth, and we're just, they're just dedicated there. This was in the film, it's, it's called pre-crime. It's a police, police investigators who stop crimes because they have advanced information about where and when and who is going to commit a crime. So they intervene just before the crime is committed, and they have authority to jail somebody because he had the intention to commit the crime. And the proof is that pre-crime can prove that it was going to happen. So this is science fiction, of course, but it can make you think about where this might be going with this issue about precognition. OK, so back to reality. Now, it's funny that Dean used the same slide I discovered. If we want to boost psi, if we want to go beyond this kind of rather mechanical, rather meaningless card guessing task, and we want to bring it closer to life, and closer maybe to the themes we're talking about here, how do we do it? In the field, in this field, sci research field, there have been basically three strategies. One is, let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to when we used to have special subjects, people that are born talented, and let's just work with them, period. Forget the rest. Let's go for the best. A second strategy, is to assume that the conscious mind, the one that makes decisions and choices, is mostly our adversary as far as these phenomena are concerned. The conscious mind is ego. The conscious mind blocks out distant information because most of the time it's not relevant. And the conscious mind is focused on the here and now. So Dean was saying this morning, you know, do we really want these phenomena full blast? Because how are we going to focus on our daily business if they're coming in all the time? So one way of getting around this is saying, let's go below the conscious mind and seeing what's happening at, maybe at the body level, maybe at something that's barely perceptible. And so here we use physiological you know, sensors and leads and so forth. And uh, we try to see if somehow the person is reacting to distant information, even though the person has no idea. 
Third strategy, altered states. Uh, this is a funny word, but it basically means, is there some mind state, physiological, but above all, mental state, in which we're more receptive than our normal state? So if, for example, you're not really interested by what I have to say and you start falling asleep, you know, this is called the hypnagogic state. So do you suddenly become more suggestive, more sensitive to distant information that's maybe more interesting than what's going on here while you're falling asleep? So this is an altered state. Dreams are an altered state. Meditation is an altered state. Deep meditation. So this is a third approach. Um, and we've tried all three, and they are, the payoff is obvious. The payoff is obvious because the effect sizes we're finding, in other words, the meaningfulness of the data we're extracting is clearly over, way over this card guessing approach. And so I think it's pointing to the way of what it means to be connected and is doing so in a laboratory context which is kind of artificial, but still, it's, it's pointing to something meaningful. So, quickly, the go for the best, I'm just going over that quickly. Uh, this is the special subjects approach. You may have heard, or may not have heard of a program in the United States that lasted for over 20 years. It was funded by the Department of Defense, by the Department of Intelligence, uh, the CIA. It was a psychic spying program. And what they did is that they went around, this was during the, the, the war games with the, United, with the, uh, the Russians, with the USSR. Um, basically, the Americans were afraid that the Russians were doing this, and the Russians were afraid the Americans were doing it. So they said, why not, let's just try some. Anything works, if anything works, then we'll try psychic spying, among other things. And they went through this big program testing with the kinds of show, tests I showed you, 3,000 military. Out of that, they picked six. So you can see this is a very elitist approach. They didn't just take it. They said, these are going to be our psychic spies. And they tr did some training programs and so forth. And one of them, one of the stars was Joseph McMonagall, who's still with us. And Ed May, uh, who's a physicist, was the director of one of the laboratories dedicated to this psychic spying program. All of this was classified for 20 years. We, researchers that some of us, like myself, I was working in Princeton, I had no idea what was going on. And these were people that I knew pretty well. These are colleagues, but they could not say a word about what they were doing. So anyway, um, just to give you some examples, Joseph McMonagall, uh, you may see that this, was, this is a, a laboratory, a pretty important laboratory in the, on the West Coast. And you see the building on the left, upper left there. You see the building he draw, the road with the trees, the road with the trees. So this is somebody who is several dozens or sometimes hundreds of miles from the site. There's one person who goes on site, and the other person is back in the lab trying to draw what he thinks the, the, the physical viewer is seeing. He's trying to just kind of get a, an overview, and he gets into this state of, let's say it's kind of like, sometimes it's automatic, it's like automatic writing. It's like you're not very conscious. Here it wasn't, you can tell, because he used a ruler and everything, obviously. But it's kind of quick, and you try to let impressions come through. This was an extremely good viewer, Joseph McGonagall. He's not run-of-the-mill. Uh, another example, yeah, so here the target site, this one was 100 miles away from the lab. The, the sender, the outgoing person, is on the site, and the viewer sketches this, and he writes down some words, and this is what he sees. Now, all these targets are randomly selected. The person who is in the lab has absolutely no idea where the outgoing viewer is. It's any place is defined, any place within a 100 mile radius. And they just have to give them time to get there. And then the session begins. 
This was a missile test. There were several of these trials. So he, you know, captures the missile test and several different uh, items that are related, like glowing materials, a missile test, and the cloud, and the sounds in the environment. Uh, so there are a lot and a lot of examples of this. If you're interested, there are plenty of references that uh, I can give to you. But just to show you that there are several different labs at different times dedicated to this research. And they found, of course, nice big p-values. But more important, their effect sizes are now approaching. They're bigger than what we call small. They're definitely bigger than the minuscule. They're bigger than what's called small effect sizes. And they're starting to approach moderate effect sizes. And we don't find moderate effect sizes just anywhere. We find them in some medical research, and we find, but it's not that common. It's pretty good effect sizes. But again, all this depends on gifted subjects. Now, let's go to strategy two. Strategy two is looking below the surface and seeing, does the normal guy have some psi, some connectedness, is there some connectedness manifest in us? Not just because we're psychic, we're just maybe at a constant low level. And the, the uh, monsieur here, Douglas Dean, was, uh, he started this really. I, I think he was one of the earliest persons to start this. He did this in telepathy experiments. He, would, he had a large number of names, for example, all shuffled together. Some of those names were meaningful to the receiver, and some of them were not. And the receiver was hooked up to a plethysmograph, you know, measuring pressure, uh, blood pressure here. And so at, a, at an agreed time, the sender now who's in another room would turn one card after the other. And when he would fall on a meaningful name, even though he didn't know, because these were just names that the other guy wrote, he just shuffled them. This was a double blind experiment. So he wouldn't know. He would turn them one after the other. And when the name was a meaningful, suddenly there was a little beep in the plethysmograph. Something was reacting in the other person. So this was kind of a, an early sign of this, an early version of the experiments that got much more sophisticated. Now take a look at this image that's showing here. Not very happy, right? You see that, and chances are, if the screen is a few inches away, from your face, and you suddenly see it popping up, you, there might be a little reaction in you. At any rate, it will certainly be a different reaction from this one, right? This is just normal, boring, and this is pretty aggressive. So this is a standard thing that we use in physiological experiments. We just try to compare how people react to different images, and we look at different measures, like blood, skin, uh, I mean, uh, skin conductance level, or temperature, or heartbeat, or EEG. And we see what are the curves that correspond to this kind of an image versus this kind of an image. So a person is taking this st session, and they're hooked up to different kinds of systems. It depends on who's done the experiment. But there, there are many experiments of this sort now. There are more over 40. This is quite recent. And they're hooked up to EEG kind of things or skin conductance. And they're also exposed to different kinds of targets. Sometimes they're neutral. Sometimes they're erotic. Sometimes they're aggressive. Sometimes it's a sound, a burst of sound, or silence. And we just keep looking at what's happening in their body. So. First, there's a blank screen. Then there's, boom, the image comes. Then there's a blank screen, time for them to recover. And all this time, we're looking at what's happening in your body. And then in the next trial, blank screen, boom, the image comes, and we look at what's happening in your body. Okay? And of course, all this is random. You, there's no pattern to this, so you can't predict rationally. What we find is interesting. Once you're exposed to the image 
of course, it's normal. You'll have a very different reaction. I don't have a pointer here. You have a very different reaction if it's a calm image versus an aggressive image. You, that's obvious. But what's interesting is that we find even before you see the image, there's something happening. The two curves are separating. If you keep doing trial and trial and trial and trial again, you see that people have a tendency to pre-react to the aggressive images even before they've been de determined. OK, and this has been done with different measures. Uh, this, for example, is with an audio tone, like a burst of a strong sound. And in the bottom here, you can see that there's a separation. That pink curve is dipping just before you actually hear it. So it's a bit, it's maybe not very exciting, but it's very exciting from a scientific perspective. At any rate, this is our dean, because dean was uh, largely responsible for relaunching this research on presentiment. Uh, again, the effect sizes are quite respectable, 0.21. This is not quite usable yet, but it's in the right direction. And it's very disturbing because, as you can see, what would it mean if things were working this way? In other words, before the cause, you know, the, normally the cause, when things move in a certain way in time. And if you start having reactions before the bell rang and you hear the bell before it rings, that would kind of... Uh, disturb our normal way of thinking and doing in the world. But that's what seems to be coming out. OK. Um, can I have an idea how I'm doing in terms of time? I just have 10 minutes. OK. Third approach, altered states. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. Well, this I could say at least. So just to give you the, no, I'll skip it because it's going to take too much time. Basically, in, when I joined this field, I discovered this field through the Maimonides Dream Laboratory. This is a laboratory in New York at the Maimonides Hospital, uh, which was established by uh, two individuals, Montague Allman and Stanley Krippner. And what they were interested in seeing is whether in dreams we're particularly receptive to telepathy. Because there are loads and loads and loads of cases, spontaneous cases, that suggested we're especially receptive. That's when most of the people who have experiences have them during dreams, during the nighttime. How many of you have had an experience, a psychic? what you would call a premonition or telepathy experience. Can I get a raise of hands? Maybe 10%, 15%. How many of those people had them either in a dream state or something like that? Premonition or whatever, one, two, three, four, five, six. About half, maybe half. So this is interesting because one single state seems to be predictive of the fact that you may have a, a telepathic experience. So these um, researchers decided to focus on that, and they did a number of sessions. Basically, the person would sleep all night, the receiver, would be hooked up, and whenever we knew that the person was dreaming, we'd wake them up. And I'd say, OK, please tell me your dream. And they'd tell you your dream, and I was uh, doing that. Uh, uh. So I'd say, OK, thank you. Go back to sleep. And OK, and then an hour goes by, and they start dreaming again. We can see it from the captors. OK, please wake up. And they would wake up. And so this goes on all night. It's a very pleasant experience to be woken up every time you have a dream. Uh, and it goes on four, five, six times a night. In the morning, finally, the person can, you know, struggles in. They wake him up for good. During the whole time, there was a sender in another room who was looking at an image. This was a randomly selected image. That's what they were trying to send to the dreamer. In the morning, 
the receiver comes out of their room and they're confronted with several images. In this case, it was eight. So they say, okay, now we'll read back all the dreams you had on the basis of what you saw all night long. Can you pick one of these images being the one that the person was staring at? And, well, given what they saw, I was in the class made up of half a dozen people, it felt like a school, there was one little girl that was trying to dance with me. Well, Degas uh, School of Dance seemed to be the like, most likely candidate, so they circle it. And then, once that's done, it's finished, the person calls in the sender who must reveal now, for the first time, what the real target was, and so now we know if we had a hit or a miss. And so we do this many times. And we accumulate the statistics. And one example was with Malcolm Besant. He, this wasn't thousands of trials. It was just two series of eight nights. In each of these series, he had five direct hits out of eight. That is very significant. That's very improbable that that could have happened by chance. So this, was a, this dream telepathy approach was a real break with the approach using cards. It was the first real study with altered states of consciousness that was getting closer to real life, so to speak, to real life psi, where dreams seem to be a major uh, way of uh, accessing psi abilities. I'll skip this. So there were other states that were explored. Hypnosis was explored. Um, this is called sleep onset. This is like when you're starting to fall asleep, yeah? the hypnagogic state. That was also explored. Relaxation, oops, sorry, that's not what I meant. Relaxation was explored also. And uh, meditation, for those who might be curious, that's David Lynch up there. Meditation was also one of the key areas explored. Each of these areas represents several studies that have been done that give positive results, good positive results. Um, but I'm going to just, this last few minutes, I'd like to focus on this approach, which is called the Gansfeld. And uh, this involves putting halved ping pong balls on your eyes and uh, headphones with white noise, which is like, Shh, you know, the sound we used to hear between two radio stations that random noise. The ping pong balls makes everything completely diffuse, like you're in a very thick fog. So your eyes are open, but you can't see a thing. And when you're in this kind of thing for a long time, the white noise and the ping pong balls, and we ask you to talk, to free associate all along, and this lasts like 30, 40 minutes. After five or 10 minutes, you're in an altered state. You're, you're not in your normal state. You're getting into like a a dreamlike state, yet you're not asleep completely. So there have been many um, studies done with this, dozens of studies. Um, and so here's the sender. This is Charles Onerton, my mentor, uh, in the one room, in the soundproof, sound isolated room, and the receiver in another room, in the Gansfeld, the receiver is just thinking out loud. Uh, and then, in the end, the receiver has to pick out which of the four targets was sent by the sender, okay, which were randomly selected by computer. Okay, so, <laughs> well, I have a few examples, but basically it's to give you the quality. The quality of these sessions is sometimes very, very impressive. And the people that participate are not psychics. These are people that are just curious. We had, in, when I was at Princeton, we had 260 subjects run through. I don't think there was one psychic in there, one official psychic. But at any rate, they were all just curious people. Um, so you could see that the quality sometimes and the differences between the kinds of things they said. Here, this is Dali's uh, Christ Crucified. And, you know, he's naming Jesus and he's talking about spirit guides and a woman that's looking up and dark and deaf. And this is a picture in front of the French uh, Beaubourg Center uh, with a, a flamethrower 
And the person who was here was the dean of psychology at, um, at Yale University, Irv Child. And these are partial transcripts. In his full transcript, he mentioned the word flames something like 30 times. He just was obsessed with flames in that session. Here, this person was constantly obsessed with uh, birds, and very specific birds, very pointed, big feathers, named the eagle. Again, there is no, absolute, no indication of what the nature of these targets would be. There's no knowledge, you don't, the receiver has no idea. This is uh, from a film called the, the Titans or something. And as you can say, the waterfall and cities, monuments, tore, water gushing, dread, temples falling, soldiers running. It's uh, again. This is a documentary on a bridge that actually collapsed in the 50s, the United States. And um, again, it gives you the idea of you could almost say the person is describing the target from memory as opposed to describing a target that's not within their visual field or their past experience. So, okay, drop that. I mentioned three strategies. This was three approaches for enhancing connectedness. And it's true that it's in an artificial lab situation, which is the laboratory, but that means it's so much more likely that in real life, which is not artificial, and which there are strong emotions and there are real experiences, it's much more likely that these kinds of things are just under our radar. And the question is then, are there ways to enhance these phenomena for our own use? Um, I'll skip all this. These are five great heroes of the last century. Oh no, this was a mistake, that's not him. Uh, that's not him, that's him, Henry Bergson. <laughs> he just looks alike, but any resemblance is accidental. So, but these are great, great, great men, philosophers and scientists who anticipated this idea that maybe our mind is not entirely personal. It doesn't belong 100% to us. Part of our mind maybe stretches out like roots meeting or islands meeting under the water, and maybe under exceptional circumstances, something comes through. And something not just from distance, but something also from our own future, because presumably we're also connected to our own life path, our own life trace. And maybe sometimes we remember the past, but sometimes we remember the future, and we have premonitions. So I guess the take home here if there is one, there are three key factors that, that re synthesize what we have found in research. One is a concept is, which is openness to experience. Tightness being kind of, host not, not hostile, but being kind of pushing out the world means we're in, isolated in our shells. And I think objectively these people just won't have experiences. And that's okay because their life is structured around that. But if you want to have this larger intuition, this larger contact with the world that's around, and I think leadership is also about connectedness. It's also about picking up subtle cues in the word, world and knowing where the world is going. Well, in that case, openness, flexibility and creativity, Empathy, all these are factors that seem to enhance this connectedness. And this can be seen on an experimental level with distant events and objects. The second factor is this whole idea of accessing a deeper self. Whatever the practice is, whatever the approach, noise reduction, meditation, mental disciplines of martial arts that are really oriented towards the inner self, all these and again, this is upheld by research, help us access either distant information, information from other people, or perhaps even information from our own future. This seems to be pretty, the data is definitely going in that direction. The third element 
is, right, total belief. When I say total belief, that's exaggerated. Even I don't believe it totally. But, and it's, again, this whole thing is how you balance healthy skepticism versus just blocking things out. And everybody that's involved in this field is a skeptic. But we're skeptics that listen and look at the data and we ask real questions to the world. We ask questions, does it work this way? Let's do an experiment to see. So the sheep-goat effect, something we call in creativity, at least I brought this in from more from the creativity field, the angel's advocate as opposed to the devil's advocate. It, these are attitudes that open us towards possibilities. And I think that it's healthy to be devil's advocate sometimes, and it's healthy to be angel's advocate as well. That's it, folks. Thank you.